Hi, my name is Patrick Greeno, and I'm a published professional speaker and business owner. I've been sharing insights on leadership, technology, business, and marketing to students and business executives since 2010. My classes and seminars are developed from research and personal experience. Here's a 15-minute compilation of clips showcasing my teaching style. I hope you enjoy it. How do I learn to be an entrepreneur while in college? So when I was in business school, they taught me a lot about theory and practice. Uh, but when I got out, I was like, well, how do I register a DBA or... How do I brand my, how do I, what do I do to get a sign made for my company? Or I had to kind of dissect all the little pieces um, involved in creating my own business. So what are some benefits of student organizations? Can anybody think of them? Growth. Growth, sure, okay. Your um, professional development. Development, growth and development, yeah, what else? Connections. Connections, networking, good, what else? Networking, we talked about job prospecting. So even if we're not going to be an entrepreneur, some of us are probably going to want to work for an entrepreneur, right? Which is fine too, because they need, they need their team. So getting FaceTime with key executives often is a very a significant benefit of getting involved with student organization. Personal growth, we mentioned. Uh, identifying strengths and weaknesses. Who here knows what our strengths and weaknesses are? It's okay if you don't. It took me a while to figure that out. Okay. And you know, taking an objective view at our skill set of, of, hey, we're really good at this, but we're not good at this. And I can't tell myself I'm going to be good at that because there's some things I'm just not good at. And that's OK. Improving communication skills is a big one too, right? So crafting emails. But not just an email. Sales copy or uh, persuasion emails, negotiation emails, working on your tone. Right? If I was up here yelling at you guys, how do you guys think it would you'd handle it? Probably be pretty like, well, this guy's a little bit too much for me. I don't think I want to go and see him again. But if I'm more warm and welcoming, the sound of my tone, that's, that stuff matters. But it also matters on email, too. And the way you communicate with other people, when you introduce yourself to other people, that matters, too. Where, you, where your name tag at networking events matters, too. Team building and morale enhancement. What do you think of when you think of morale enhancement? What is morale? Yeah. Like set of standards that you um, are held by, as we so. Close. Yeah. Think of it as like, if we're all really excited about something, all of us in this room, the morale is really strong. Mm -hmm. We're all together thinking and talking about it, an idea together as a team, and then we work on it with another group on the same thing, and they're excited about it too. Really strong morale, mm -hmm. right? Securing paperwork. Every business or organization has to do this to really put it in place in your organization. Really, to basically tell the college, here's who we are, here's what we do, here's when we meet, here are numbers of you know, uh, members, etc. Same with a business. When you start a business, you kind of need to tell, you know, kind of, you have to tell the, the, the city what it, who you are. What, like, that's essentially what it is. And a lot of times, at least for me, uh, my experience with this is really done um, to a it's twofold. Branding yourself, but also how to report your taxes at the end of the year when you run a business. You won't. I mean, you could have your business name as your own name, but to separate, at least for me, I separated my personal name with my business name because my business name encompasses a variety of different things, and I want it to be more general than that. So when I report taxes, it's like, okay, my business, this name, then made this much money in this year, and then I report accordingly. Officer recruiting and training, this is a big piece of it, right? So how do we find good people for our team? How do we load our bus with the right people? so that we don't load our bus with the wrong people and have to deal with training, bureaucracy, and hierarchy. Right? How do we load our bus with the right people right out of the gate so that we can have personal, we can have autonomy, freedom, and, and we can achieve success in a more efficient way? Member recruiting, kind of like what I'm doing right now in a sense, is direct marketing for this content. Right? When you get in front of people, we're talking about the classroom announcement here, it's a great way to, oh, well, a great way to learn how to speak publicly. Who's here scared of being where I am right now, being in front of people? Are you, is anybody scared of speaking public, publicly? It's okay to admit it. I was, like, 15 years ago. I was in public speaking in 2001, and I gave the same presentation twice. It was a, there was a midterm and a final. My professor after the final, she was like, Patrick, how is that any different than the first one? I was like, well, it's my final. <laughs> Identify your role as early on as possible and plan accordingly. Figure out what it is you do. The VP of marketing and the VP of advertising are very closely related. 
got to identify what's what. Now, every organization is, is, is different in such a way that uh, some are small, some are large, some have five people, some have 50 people. Um, it makes sense to put yourself in a VP position that requires skills that you don't actually already have. So for example, we're marketing majors. By default, we're going to be interested in being a VP of marketing. This is just because, oh, I want to be a VP of marketing. Well, it makes sense because I'm a marketing major. But there can only be one VP member of uh, marketing, and no VP is any better than the others. But there, the other organs, uh, the other VPs are are just as important too. And it's good to put yourself in a situation where you're uncomfortable. That way, you can learn a new trade, a new skill. Uh, for example, if you're a marketing major, put yourself in a VP of finance role, VP of accounting, VP of membership. If you're not very good at public speaking, or you're, this this freaks you out. Put yourself in VP of membership role and do classroom announcements. That'll be a really good practicer for you for when you finish school. I always recommend um, uh, exercising uh, new abilities and trying things while in school and just in life in general. So you got social media, okay? So you got LinkedIn groups. Create one for the American Marketing Association Pepperdine. You know, there's a lot of people. I don't know how many. Raise your hand if you're on LinkedIn. Raise your hand if you're on Facebook. And more hands, of course. Mm -hmm. But so you can get all these members to get information when you send out for meetings and things. You can still do the grassroots marketing, like you guys were talking about earlier, like putting uh, flyers on doors. You can still do that as well. And this you can also do, so it, it hits them in two different uh, two different methods as well. Create a Facebook page too, um, and uh, try to populate that with anybody who's interested, and send out information uh, when necessary. Because there's a lot of noise out there, and you want to kind of cut through it and, and um, come off as I'm going to share with you information only when it's pertinent. So that's a good idea for me. Something I like to talk about too. Retention, add value. So uh, if you can maintain the amount of members you have in your first meeting and all the way to your last meeting of the semester, you, that's that's amazing. Now it's it's best to plan your your semester, the whole thing, before the semester starts. What I like to do is take the summer and the winter breaks, and if I'm going to be an officer for the following spring or the following fall, I take these times as opportunity to plan for the semester. So I create events. You guys can do this. Create meeting times, projects, guest speakers, whatever it is you got to do to plan for the mar uh, plan for the semester. You can get it done during those two times. And something about the syllabus is that when you when you have your first meeting. Um, and you want to pass this out to your members, and you're, you're going to want to do that. Pass it out after the meeting's over with, because if I gave you a piece of paper right now, right when I, before I got up and talked, got up and uh, started talking, where is your attention going to be? Right. On the paper. That's right. Guess what? I'm going to be up here standing talking about this, and that's going to diminish the integrity of my presentation, and you won't get as much value out of it. So if I, if I left here and gave you something to walk away with, then you can look and check the dates, so I can maybe make this, so I've got this, we've got soccer thing or whatever. So, food costs money. How do we recoup that expense? What I used to do is um, offset the charge by, offset the fee by charging a little extra for membership. That way everybody kind of pays for the food. So, for example, if it costs $55 to be a member, charge $60, and then an extra $5 will go into an account. And then that money will be used for things like food and travel. Granted, I know we can't travel on five bucks. But over the course of time, a couple semesters, we might be able to send like two or three people to a national conference. Sponsored events. When you sponsor an event, a company provides something to you, possibly for free, that's optimal. Being a nonprofit, you want everything for free. And in exchange, you promote their business logo on any marketing materials. So hey, we're gonna, rooms are expensive, let's face it. We want to have a room reserved to say the Radisson or some you know, nice hotel, whatever. Um, it's going to cost some money. So, what if the Radisson sponsored an event? Let's just say, and they can maybe provide a room. I'm not saying they will. It's so just an example. Um, essentially, what you're doing is finding a client that might provide something free to you in exchange for marketing for a company. You're marketing now to two groups of, of, of members: their organizations, members, and our organizations, members. So, let's say if I have 500, they have 500. We now have a marketing uh, awareness total of a little bit thousand members that can, that can receive this message. So, that's very, very beneficial. Um, and also, when you share, when you partner together for the, for you know, you build a relationship. When they, the other organization might have a, an idea for an event. You're highly, you're more likely to be considered for a partnership to, to work together on a future endeavor. 
that's that's um, just a great advantage to, to building partnerships with other organizations. So identifying your target target audience at the executive level, the national level, we we leave this up to our affiliates. It's entirely up to you as affiliates. Uh, it's your own discretion to identify your target audience. We understand that location there are different target audiences, and you know you might want to target mid-level managers, C-suite, whatever the case. It's entirely up to you. Um, whatever it is, you structure your meetings in accordance with that. Also here, I want to specifically indicate that if you're an up-and-coming brand new affiliate, you know, if Atlanta is coming up and wants to not yet, under doesn't quite understand what their target market is, create service offerings that you think will generate a target audience. Essentially, it's all in the value of your offering. So if you offer something of high value, you'll create that audience automatically. And then when that audience is created and generated, then you can ask them, what it is they want in addition to in the future events. Identifying talent, this is a really good one too, is that um, you know, sometimes maybe I'll look for a programmer, so I'll, I'll attend an event and I'll, I'll kind of walk around and see if I can find somebody who does something really specific. And this is a really great way to do it is, is you know, maybe, maybe I'll find somebody and I'll say to myself, maybe I can give this guy a little test and, and you know, say, you know, show me, show me two or three lines of your code. And just for free, he would maybe give me something, and I would just kind of build a relationship that relationship that way. It's just a really good way to try to find something, some something from somebody that can help you, and you can help them back. So what I just try to do is design a business card with my personal brand in mind. Here, here, who, who here knows about personal branding? What's personal branding, Jen? Um, one's test. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, creating like an image for yourself, like how you want to be perceived. Yeah, absolutely. So we're all brands, all of us, each one of us. We're individual brands. Whether we like it or not, it's just the way it is. We've been like this since day one. So as we got older and developed a sense of self, we have to figure out how we want to be as a brand. What kind of brand do we want to be? How, are we, how do we want people to see us? And you know, the brand identity is how we, how we want to be perceived. The brand image is how people perceive us. We want those to be the same thing. That's the goal. Okay, but we have to identify first the identity first before we can figure out what the image is. So just think about that. How do you want to be perceived, and are you being perceived that way? I grew up skateboarding. I used to be a sponsored skateboarder, and um, I'm you know, a musician as well. I guess you could probably tell by the haircut. <laughs> uh, so when I went to college, I came with like a skateboard, and like, you know, I looked like I came off of a skate video. But so it's, when I went into a job interview, you know, I, I didn't really know how to dress. I, I, I bought like a button-up t-shirt and some jeans, because I never really dressed up. Um, and I ended up getting some jobs, but as I got older and I got more mature and I got into grad school, I started wearing like blazers casually and wearing button-up t-shirts casually. Now, I retired t-shirts and I retired tennis shoes and all I wear is like dress shoes and, you know, collared shirts. But it took me a long time to figure out that when I take myself seriously, people will take me seriously and opportunities will open up for me that are maybe more profitable than if I didn't take myself seriously. So really pay attention to that. Plus, at the end of the day, we all look better with collar shirts. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And when you feel good about what you wear, you feel good about who you are. When you feel good about who you are, you present yourself really well. And when you do that, you can be really confident. And when you're really confident, doors open. So it's almost like buying really nice clothes when you can swing it financially helps you financially. Okay? So focus on your strengths and improve them because that's where you're going to find the most efficient use of your time in this lifetime. And your identification of your skill set is a big piece. The other piece of identification is once you've identified your skill, identify where in the market your skills could be used to produce something of value to take care of your audience and yourself at the same time. You might be thinking, well, how do I find a market opening? This is what we call this, a market opening, a market need that hasn't yet been accommodated by a competitor. Okay? So, market need. So you're thinking, how do I do that? What do I do to do that? And when you're passionate about something, you spend enough time acquiring enough knowledge about that thing in that industry, you're able to put yourself in a situation to identify a market need, a unique and specific market need that may or may not been, have been capitalized on yet. And if it has, that's okay. Because all you do is perform a very brief competitive analysis and think to yourself three things. Can I create a better version of this product? Faster? and more cost-effective. In project management, we call this the triple constraint. Scope, cost, and schedule. If there is not a competitor, you can own a market. 
And you can be the person that people think of as the category leader in that one thing. When people think of phones, who are the companies they think about? So those are service providers. <laughs> but yes, okay. Someone said Apple's a good one. When someone thinks of cars, what are the companies they think about? Ford. <laughs> kind of a few companies there, right? Everybody here has the ability to achieve greatness. And I want everybody to stand up. Stand up, stand, stand, stand. Oh, stand. <laughs> Give yourselves a round of applause. For more information, send me a message through my website at patrickgreeno.com. Thanks.